to be. Again, we present Grant and Lila um, for the first presentation. Lila and Grant, you, I'm going to request that you stand close to the mic and speak as loudly as possible. The floor is yours. Okay, so why meat preservation? Um, so we're both meat eaters and um, um, primarily a bunch of boiled rice. We have a broiler chicken that's been rice processed and, and heat here on the farm. But otherwise, most of our diet is what you can eat right on the farm. But for me, um, I will continue to be a uh, eater, and I found this project. And um, also to do it in a more environmentally way. Seems like some of the feedback is that the sound is low. I'm gonna talk up a little bit. Uh, hopefully this will work. Um, it's better. It's it is better if you stand really closely. We'll try to get another computer running for the next presentation. But show us show us your face in in its entirety, and we'll hear you well. So we do a lot of preser preservation practices here on the mountain, including uh, canning, fermentation, pickling, freezing, dehydration. And we wanted to continue in that spirit of learning other forms of preservation, specifically meat preservation. And so uh, we took it upon ourselves to research salt curing and uh, smoking meat uh, for our capstone. All right, next slide. So the history of preserving meat uh, spans across several thousand years and also exists in many different cultures as well as methods of meat preservation. Like the oldest uh, evidence of meat preservation dates back to 3000 BCE, which is about 5,020 years ago from today, where meat and fish were preserved in sesame oil and was also dried and salted. Um, and this evidence date, dates back to Mesopotamia. Um, there's also evidence from 200 BCE and the Greek, Greek and Roman empires um, that uh, salted meat was uh, widely uh, consumed. And then also from uh, the 11th century CE, that it, there's evidence that indicates that Turkic peoples of Central Asia also salted and air dried meats, as well as from the 12th century West Africa. So these examples, um, amongst many more, indicate just how global meat preservation practices were and continue to be. And it really revolutionized the ability and the ease in which people were able to consume meat. Um, and it also eliminated a dependence on seasonal availability of food resources and made it possible for people to transport food over uh, large distances. So really a, a cornerstone of, of human development. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Um, to talk about the history of meat preservation as it exists in Highland County and also a greater United States uh, context, um, before colonial settler, settlers arrived in the United States, uh, there is extensive evidence of the indigenous tribes of the Great Plains smoking and drying game meats. Um, these include the Blackfoot, Cree, Lakota, and Cheyenne tribes. Um, and then as colonial settlers began to arrive in the, in the country and form communities, 
uh, they began to mimic a lot of the meat preservation traditions as well as develop their own. Um, in Kylan County, there's an extensive canning tradition here. Um, and also there were many homesteads in the area would have two or three hogs. And as winter approached, communities would come together and have what were called butchering days. You can see a photo of a butchering day in Highland County here on this slide. Um, and the communities would come together and they would butcher hogs together and families would go home and begin to can and prepare these meats for the winter. Uh, two popular dishes from this area that we learned about were um, one was called Ponhoffs, which would be ground up um, pork, meat, and fat, and it would be combined with cornmeal to make uh, cakes, and these cakes would be canned for the winter. And then also crock sausage, where meat would be, or uh, fatty meat would be rendered in uh, crock pots to allow lard to rise to the top of the pot. Um, and it would be allowed to cool and become anaerobic. And these crock sausages would be stored in the root cellar and could be pulled from throughout the winter. Um, and then a uh, kind of ubiquitous 21st century preservation item that has become very popular is the jerky. Uh, the word jerky comes from a South American Quechua word known as charqui. And that meant burned or dried. And it was one of these styles and preservations that indigenous folks practiced where they would dry and smoke meats over open fires. Um, and we wanted to kind of pull on that tradition. And so one of the items that we made was the jerky. Next slide. Um, OK, so so um, so had, has played a a transformational role in the collective history of humanity. The, the ability to preserve food through salt was really a foundational aspect of how civilizations were able to develop and adapt, and as we touched on before. So in the, in the practice of food preservation, salt is used to inhibit the growth of microorganisms by extracting, extracting water out of microbial cells through osmosis. Um, concentrations up to 20% are required to kill most species of undesirable bacteria. 20% um, of the weight of whatever meat is being preserved. If you go above that, um, it kind of affects the taste of the meat as well as the, the quality. It becomes a little bit more brittle. A brittle. Um, so for our presentation, uh, for our capstone, whatever, um, we worked with lamb and beef. Um, and we, for salt, we use a coarse sea salt as well as a curing salt with nitrates, which you can see a picture of in the upper left hand corner. corner. The nitrate salt is hot pink. Um, so we had lamb shanks um, as well as beef cuts that we uh, buried in salt, um, both with the coarse sea salt and then we did a curing salt. Um, and then we also did a thin cuts of beef for the beef jerky. And um, just to, before I finish talking about salt, just to briefly say that nitrates, we did want to uh, use salt that had nitrates in it because it's becoming an increasingly popular way of doing salt curing. And nitrates are a bit controversial, um, but they are a natural occurring chemical that aids in meat preservation as well as fur retention. Um, but they can be toxic at high levels, so we were pretty careful to not uh, use more than we needed, um, but we did use them just to kind of diversify uh, the methods that we were trying. Um, so we put the meat, all of the cuts of meat into the salt and let it sit for about a week. And then for our beef jerky, we immediately smoked that, which uh, Grant will talk about. And then for our lamb shanks, um, we let, the, let them sit in the salt with nitrates a little bit longer. And then we also salted those. Um, sorry, we also smoked those. And then we had a coarse sea salt lamb shank um, salt cure that now we are air drying. So over the course of the entire curing process, you wanna see a 35% weight decrease um, which we have seen, but we're still um, 
air curing our, our primary energy. Um, and then also for the air cure, uh, we learned that we, the ideal conditions are 70% humidity at, and 52 degrees Fahrenheit, which um, those ideal conditions for air curing were a little bit difficult for us to create, um, which is why, partly why the air cure on our, on our ranch is still underway. All right. Now to Next slide. Yeah. Um, so for our smoking methods, we, uh, which I'll talk about in a moment, we built a, a DIY meat smoker out of a retired file cabinet. Um, but to touch on the methods of smoking, what we did was, uh, is known as cold smoking. And cold smoking is generally done at burning temperatures uh, of wood as low as 80 degrees and up to 180 degrees while hot smoking is considered to start at 220 degrees and go higher. Uh, cold smoking is done primarily for long-term preservation purposes. Uh, the cold smoke will smoke treat and simultaneously dry meat. And when I say smoke treating, smoke uh, imbues meat with antimicrobial and antibacterial properties in the system, the chemical compounds of the burning wood. Um, and then simultaneously, the heat of the smoke works to dry the meat. Um, and cold smoking can take as long as one day to 30 days, depending on uh, what you're going for. Whereas hot smoking is done typically to consume shortly after the smoking period, because if smoke treats and cooks the food, the meat simultaneously, not necessarily drying it out. Um, and this usually takes up to 48 hours or so, depending on the amount and size of meat that you're going for. see that can can anyone confirm that they can hear us even if our image is gone yes all right great okay great um so here are some images of the meat smoker that we built and us in action and what we did was we took a two-tiered filing cabinet that was donated to us by uh jessa our director and in the bottom drawer we drilled a hole in the face of the bottom drawer to allow the extension cord of a hot plate to come out of it. And you can see that in the third photo here. And um, the hot plate acted as the heating element of our smoker and on it went a metal pot filled with soaked wood chips. And then above that in the second drawer, we had um, in the floor of the second drawer, we drilled a few large holes to allow the smoke to penetrate those upper levels. And then in the side of the file cabinet, we installed a uh, thermometer. So essentially, we created just a very simple meat smoker. And uh, when we were ready to go, we turned on the hot plate and started smoking our wood chips. And in the upper drawer, we installed a uh, simple drip tray with aluminum foil and used a cooling rack to suspend our meat. As you can see in the fourth photo, that's our beef jerky going. Um, yeah, and we smoked our beef jerky for a total of about eight hours. Um, and we found that our hot plate, given like the strength of our hot plate and the cold temperatures up here on the mountain, took a little longer than we anticipated. So we smoked it for a long time, and then we finished it for a couple of hours in our dehydrator that we have here on the mountain. And the final product turned out great, and we've been eating it. And it's right here. We've obviously been eating it. Uh, but yeah, and then we used the same meat smoker to smoke the uh, whole lamb shanks and uh, like larger beef cuts that we have. And then it will also act as an air drying chamber. Oh, we can go on to the next slide now. Oh, yeah, and here are just more photos of the beef jerky and the lamb shanks and the uh, larger cut of the All right, so what worked, what didn't? Um, in terms of salt curing, um, we didn't really have a, a place to really achieve those ideal conditions needed for an air cure. Um, so that was kind of a, yeah, something we're, we continue to work on. Um, 
Um, and as I mentioned before, our hot plate was a little weaker than we anticipated it being, or not that it was weak, it was just we had cold temperatures when we smoked the meat. And so the smoker itself would just struggle to maintain a high temperature, but it stayed well within the cold smoking range and it just took a few hours longer than we anticipated. Um, but we did manage to successfully salt cure and also cold smoke our meat. So that was fun and exciting. Um, and in terms of future rendition, we will leave behind um, our, you know, the, the materials that we produce. So the smoker and the curing salt, as well as um, a guide on how to use them. Um, so there is a potential for beef jerky to be uh, more like regularly consumed staple in the mountain country. Um, one kind of side note is that we do have we are in a an area where there is a lot of beef and sheep raised for meat consumption, um, and we were intending to source our meat locally, um, but the, the store that we were going to buy from across the town, like right when we needed the meat. So our meat is less local than we would like it to be, but, but um, there is a kind of space for that. If the store can handle it. But the wood that we use came from apple trees right on this mountain. <laughs> Don't mess up there. Um, yeah, that's it. So, um, is there any questions? Happy to answer. You're welcome to put the questions in the chat or if you want to unmute your mic and ask a question, we do have a few minutes. Thank you, Grant and Lila. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so we have one question here about whether or not how we measured the volume and the weight of the meat. Um, how much wet meat there was and what was the dry meat uh, weight when finished. So we, um, this was actually a, a recommendation that we came across after we had begun the salting process. We were still looking into methods kind of as we were underway. We found that there was a lot of conflicting information about what the ideal way um, to salt here was. So we don't have the exact way before, um, before because of that we were kind of doing this so like unfortunately not but um, I can tell you that the the wet weight of the beef jerky that we smoked it was a pound uh, it was a one pound beef fry that we cut into strips and um, the total weight of the beef jerky was about ounces if I remember correctly so it was in that range of what you wanted uh, the weight of it to decrease by um, how long did it take to smoke the lamb shank probably 48 hours um, we had to break it up um, depending on the time that we were nearby that we could watch it to make sure the hot plate didn't overheat or anything so we had to do it over a series of um, days but yeah, in total, about 48 hours. Um, the lamb shank was a bit thicker than the beef jerky. Yeah, it was about three or four times thicker than the cuts of beef jerky that went into it. So that will definitely affect the time period that it takes for the smoke to fully penetrate. Um, can poultry be dried? It can. We chose not to pursue that route of meat preservation. Um, just because we read that it is harder to preserve white meat as opposed to red meat, and we just kind of wanted to focus on what we thought we'd be able to achieve here. Um, we have a question, question about, about whether or not there was discernible difference in nitrates versus no nitrates. Um, we didn't come across any discernible differences per se, but the use of nitrates really isn't isn't overwhelmingly necessary if you have really fresh, um, high quality meat. Um, there is no reason why for sea salt won't do um, the same kind of preservation that nitrates do. 
there is a bit more color retention within the landscape, which we saw in the beach ocean. We had a really, it has a really nice red color, mm -hmm. which maybe wouldn't have been achieved if we didn't use the methods for the beach jerky. But otherwise, um, I mean, when I do this in the future, which I you know, intend to keep um, expanding on my, you know, meat preservation skills, I think I will elect to only use the species color just because of the, I don't know, the risks involved risks. with using salt nitrate. Yeah. But for perspective, when we use sea salt to cure our meats, we did what's known as sparing, literally sparing the meat in a layer of salt and a layer of underneath it and a layer of salt on top of it. And whereas when you're using nitrates, it's recommended to use one teaspoon of the pink for up to five pounds of meat. So it's really not a lot at all. And if anything, that was the largest difference, just the amount of salt that you use. Um, so for the beef jerky, we a little less than a fourth teaspoon of salt nitrates in the wet brine that we use, and you can see the, the graying of the meat, which is what you're looking for, even with just that amount of salt. And the same effect could be seen in the cut meat that we rub with the curing salt as well. Um, if there are no more questions, we will. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to both of you. Oh, there's one more question actually. I think that because of the sound and the internet, um, they are going to just switch computers um, in between these presentations. Um, Grant and Layla, are you are you still hearing us? Yes. We are, yeah. Oh, there's one more question as as Jessa logs on with the other computer. Yeah, yeah. So what about final salt content? Um, we, the coarse sea salt um, cure is the way. So we don't have a um, point of comparison between the mineral and the salt. Um, our, we hope to do of course, sea salt here for about a month, and we're almost there, but yeah. And then the beef jerky, the only way we have of measuring the salt content of the finished product is by tasting it. Um, and the beef jerky has been approved by every fellow on the mountain that eats meat, and mm -hmm. it is a appropriate salt mm -hmm. content. So I think, and we followed the same uh, general rules of applying salt to all of our other cuts of meat. So we hope that all of our other meats taste not too salty. Mm -hmm. And the last question was, is this a healthy way to eat meat? Uh, yes, this is a traditional way that meat has been eaten or consumed by communities around the world for a long time. Um, if you do have you know, uh, sensitivities to sodium intakes, it might not be the best way to eat it. But um, as, at least our beef jerky, it's probably no, Worse for you than eating meat in a typical cooking fashion. So, one thing is that when you are kind of reconstituting, rehydrating the meat to eat it, you some people do rinse it off, so you have to have like a lot of excess salt that is sitting in there. Thank you all again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Our next presentation um, is solar dehydrators, an extension of food preservation and food sovereignty. Um, All right. Can everyone hear this computer? Much better. Yay. All right. Kim, do you want to give a little introduction for our next fellows? Yes, the sound is much better. That's great. Okay, our next fellows um, that are presenting are India Fleming Kling, hailing from. All right, I'm not sure what happened to Kim, but we'll uh, keep going here. And the next fellows are India and John, 
Um, India is from Richmond and next year she will be working at Jones Garden and also helping out a little bit at the farm at Augusta Health. John is from Philadelphia and he will be up here on the mountain working with the fellows and also helping to coordinate some of our donation and outreach into the Highland County community around us. So um, John and India, if you wanna come on over. Great. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm John. I'm India. And uh, we did our capstone on solar dehydrators as an extension of food preservation and food sovereignty. So can everyone hear us? Yes. Okay. Um, so John and I were interested in solar dehydration, especially as the food preservation managers on the mountain, because we spend a lot of time um, as fellows preserving foods. And we have various methods, which Kat and, um, or well, Layla and Grant already touched on. Um, but some of them are canning, fermentation, pickling, freezing, and dehydrating. Um, and we also recognize food preservation as an extension of the food sovereignty work that we've been engaging with here on the mountain and beyond. And um, food preservation plays a critical role in, role in food sovereignty, which has been a practice of resistance and has existed for centuries, especially in black and brown communities. Um, and it extends the growing season and gives individuals the autonomy to choose what foods they have access to and consume during the cooler months. Um, and also most importantly, allows people to have access to culturally relevant foods. Um, and Fannie Lou Hamer, who is on this slide here, um, established the Freedom Farm Cooperative in 1969. And, um, she articulates the relationship of food preservation and food sovereignty super beautifully here. And she says, quote, if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, no one can push you around or tell you what to say or do. Um, so although AMI does currently have a small solar dehydrator, we saw the need to build a more um, sustainable and efficient dehydrator source for our foods. And just a quick brief history of solar dehydration to give you all some context. Um, drying food in the sun is one of the oldest methods of preservation, which um, is across many different cultures around the world. And there is evidence of dehydration of seeds, fruits, vegetables, grains, and meats in archeological sites on every continent except for Antarctica and some dating back to 12,000 years. Um, additionally, the industrial revolution led to active or forced convection dehydrators that no longer relied on the sun, but instead used heating elements and fans to create warmed airflow over the food. And lastly, as climate change concerns are becoming more a part of our daily conversations, um, so is solar energy. And we see the passive indirect solar dehydrators um, as a low impact method of preserving food. Yeah, so uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the principles of solar dehydration just before we get into the construction of our actual dehydrator. Um, first of all, there's two basic types of dehydrator. Um, there's a passive dehydrator, which is what ours is. Um, basically, there are no moving parts whatsoever. It heats um, the internal structure and um, without the use of fans or anything like that, it basically just convects the air over uh, the food. There's also direct versus indirect solar dehydration. Um, direct is the sun is beating down directly on you know, your sun-dried tomatoes or fish or whatever else you're trying to dry. And indirect, which is what our dehydrator uses, is basically using the sun's power to, again, warm air uh, to pass that over the food. Um, there's also a concept known as insulation, which is the number or the amount of uh, solar energy that a given area receives 
over the course of any given amount of time, in this case, a growing season. So it depends on your latitude, um, basically how much solar energy you receive over the course of the year. Um, our dehydrator also uses convection and negative pressure. Basically, the fact that hot air rises allows um, a negative pressure cell to form at the bottom of the dehydrator and pull more air in to be warmed. Um, it also makes use of the greenhouse effect, which traps in warm air and solar energy um, by using greenhouse plastic. Um, yeah, so the reason that this dehydration uh, using the sun lengthens shelf life is that the loss of moisture actually makes it really hard, as Grant and Layla were saying, for bacteria and fungi and um, little critters and other things like that to uh, actually take up residence in your food. So the less moisture, the more, um, you know, the more shelf stable it is and the more able it's able to keep it on the shelf. Um, there's also um, a temperature question. Basically, as you heat food past a certain temperature around 180 degrees Fahrenheit, it starts to cook. Um, whereas dehydration basically usually takes place within the range of about 100 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, and so you might be wondering why you use solar dehydration. And there are um, a lot of health benefits with using solar dehydration. And some of them are, as John already said, uh, lengthened shelf life of foods. It um, maintains nutritional value in the food as long as it's not exposed to too much sunlight. Um, it also retains nutrients for much longer than fresh produce. Um, and it helps reduce food waste and is also very cost efficient. Um, so for our construction of the solar dehydrator, we used this model here on the screen and we got our design from Dennis Scanlon, who um, for nearly 20 years has led research teams and um, has been a founder and coordinator of a technology program at the um, Appalachian State University. And so we built a seven foot long slanted collector box that collects the solar energy and heats air, which then rises through to the drying chamber. And there we have 11 racks with drying trays, which are made of food grade screening. Um, and then also in the drying chamber, there are vents, which we use screening for, and they're covered with um, sliding doors that we built. And that helps with um, allowing to control the airflow. And then with various sizes, pieces of wood, we cut wooden planks into cross braces to hold everything together. And then the pieces of wood that are exposed to natural elements, we weatherproofed using Landark, which is a mineral and plant-based oil that weatherproofs wood. Um, yeah, as far as the specifics of the actual solar collector that you saw at the bottom of the last slide, um, we actually um, used some calculations that were present in Dennis's um, guide to angle our um, dehydrator to the correct latitude, basically. So it's 118 degrees, which allows it to collect the maximum amount of solar energy for the latitude, which is about 38 degrees uh, north. Um, basically, uh, our area receives, as I was saying earlier, a specific amount of sun, and that helps to kind of, um, you know, alter over the course of the season, basically, it gets the most sunlight that it possibly can. Um, as I was saying before, the bottom vent kind of allows air in and has that negative pressure cell that then brings more air into it to be warmed by um, the sunlight and these six layers of metal lathe, which is usually used for like plaster work, but we have actually painted it black um, to absorb heat and sunlight. And then on the bottom of the collector box, there's also this reflective heavy duty aluminum foil that also maximizes how much the sun bounces around and hits these layers of lace and actually heats up the air around it. Um, allegedly, the chamber can get up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit on a uh, sunny summer day uh, when it's about 75 degrees outside with the vents closed. Um, we haven't had a chance to test that out yet, but we're hoping to hopefully next summer. There we go. 
Um, so the following slides are some pictures that we took to document, document our progress building the solar dehydrator. And um, this is, these photos are kind of where we started. So we had this cutting diagram from Dennis's guide that we used, measured out all of the pieces that we would need to cut and then used um, a circular saw to make most of our cuts and bevel different edges. Yeah, and in this slide you're seeing it's starting to become kind of a three-dimensional object. We put some of these horizontal braces in. Um, we had to do a lot of cutting here to make sure that it was, that everything was at the right angle for our specific needs and to make sure that everything kind of, you know, was flush with each other and kind of made sense and fit together nicely. And then here is, um, a fun picture of John and I posing <laughs> after we've attached the bottom of the collector box um, and using drills and whatnot. Yeah, and this is just it looking a little more complete. We've got a little few more of the cross braces. We haven't yet installed the rack uh, supports inside, um, which you'll see a little later, but um, that's what's going on here. You can see it's kind of starting to take on the shape. Um, yeah, and then here you can see that we've attached the um, aluminum foil, we glued it down and then put the lathe, which is resting on two uh, braces down the sides of the collector box. Um, and then the photo with John and I looking excited is after we glued on the greenhouse plastic and it was kind of looking like a solar dehydrator. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is the finished product. Um, we finally got it standing on its own two legs um, this past weekend. On the left, you can see inside there's those um, 11 vertical or rather horizontal uh, places that you can put uh, racks. And um, yeah, this is a finished view of basically it standing on its own four legs. Do you want to talk about the door? Oh yeah, and we attached you can see the door with like two drawstrings and that also acts as a shelf as you're working in the dehydrator and pulling out your drying trays you can rest them there which is nifty <laughs> and um yeah so a, a quick discussion of what we were successful with and some things that we had some difficulties with um, most importantly, the dehydrator does in fact work, even on cloudy, misty October days. Um, we found Dennis's explanation of what a solar dehydrator is and how it works to be super helpful. And um, John and I spent 20-ish hours building this together. And we're still good friends. So I think our communication and teamwork went pretty smoothly. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> I think um, as far as what didn't work as well, um, some of the instructions uh, in this dehydrator, if you're planning to go out and build one of these right after the presentation, um, they were a little vague. Uh, there's a lot of beveled cuts and things like that um, that are not um, explained until you kind of come up onto them and have to attach something. So we had to make a lot of in the moment decisions and kind of spur of the moment cuts and adjusting of the saw uh, and braces and things like that. Um, there were also some issues with just where things were placed inside, especially the internal mechanisms were a little confusing as to kind of where exactly we needed them. So we kind of had to figure that out on our own. Um, and then it just also assumes kind of a basic level of woodworking that maybe we didn't have going into this, but we had woods do at this point. We've gotten definitely used to the saw and everything, um, but we had to watch a couple of YouTube tutorials on how to make plunge cuts and things like that, uh, which was fun. Um, the other major issue that we had was um, shipping and handling. Um, the screens, the food grade screen that we need for our trays um, has not arrived yet. Um, we need quite a lot of it for to build these screens. So that's going to be my project over the winter, probably. Um, but um, yeah, I think that was the main, those are the main things that didn't work. Um, yeah, so we have a few things that we're hoping to accomplish with the solar dehydrator before our time on the mountain ends. 
Um, so the first thing, as John just mentioned, is building those um, drying racks so that we can, you know, begin to dehydrate various foods. And we'd also like to add a internal thermometer so that we're able to track how warm it gets and um, kind of manipulate the heat in there. And um, we're also hoping to test its performance in different weather conditions along with different foods and timing. Um, and then something that's more down the road, especially with John being at the Highland Center next year, um, we're interested in, in <clears throat> seeing what it would look like to, <coughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> to uh sorry about that <laughs> to integrate um solar dehydration <laughs> into the larger highland community basically seeing what that would look like um, i'm going to be doing a lot of like food security outreach and specifically about community preservation workshops and things like that so i'm excited to kind of um yeah just see how i can implement maybe something involving solar dehydration in highland at large um yeah, so with that, that's uh, before we get to questions, we just had a couple special thanks that we'd like to give. Um, first, most importantly, the AMI staff, especially Jessa, um, <laughs> Teddy and Kim have really, really helped us a lot with this project. Um, we could not have done it without Teddy's tool shed um, and without uh, the support of everybody here at AMI, um, especially the rest of our fellows in the cohort. Um, we, whenever we needed an extra hand or a bit of muscle to move something around, um, everybody's been really helpful and just in terms of mental health as well. It's been great to have them as sounding boards and things like that. Uh, and of course, all our animal friends, we have Raya and Ron here. Raya, not so sure about the dehydrator yet. She'll get there. Um, yeah, so that concludes our presentation. So if you have any questions, I think we have a little time for that. So thanks for watching. Thank you. Thank you. We do have time for one or two questions. Um, there are, there's one in the chat. So we have a question about the cost of um, building the solar dehydrator. I think the materials at, um, at this point came out to about 300 to 350. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, we had to buy um, a lot of plywood and just um, the lathe is rather expensive. So uh, as far as recovering cost, um, that's something we would have to certainly look into. Um, I am hoping to make up a lot of that with um, the, um, in terms of, yeah, with my time on the mountain next year, hoping to kind of dig back into that cost and get a lot of that food, you know, preserve a lot of the food that maybe we wouldn't have been able to. Um, previously. Yeah. And we were also, I think our farm manager was able to apply for like a grant kind of to build the solar dehydrator. He, yeah. It's something that he was interested in having <clears throat> just on the farm um, in general, just to be able to kind of, uh, yeah, work, work with it in the coming years. Um, we had a question about the safe for food screens. I believe they're just stainless steel that we can um, kind of scrub and kind of get it to, um, yeah, get it to be food safe. And we got a question here about um, what we're planning to desert, uh, preserve first during the cooler months. Definitely, um, there's a lot of herbs still in the garden. We have a ton of sage and even some lemon balm and uh, rosemary and thyme and things like that um, would be really good for right now. We actually still have a few tomatoes. I don't know if we want to do that yet, but we, we do still have a ton of peppers as well. Yeah. And all of our brassicas are coming in so we can make like mm -hmm. kale chips and stuff. Mm -hmm. Let's see. And we got a question here from Lori about um, concerns with the temperatures going down at night. Um, there wasn't too much mentioned about that in the guide so i would have to be i would have to look into that but i it seems to me that um the way that it works basically is that it continues to um stay warm for a little while after the sun goes down um and the fact that there's screen all the openings waterproof really allows for um maybe the only issue would be maybe humidity um it does have a roof that kind of gets rid of most of the moisture that would get in. So that's the only other really source of moisture, but we would have to certainly check that out too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then we have a question about um, selling the dry herbs. We have not that's explored a great idea, yeah. that. Yeah. I would be really that would interested. Be 
fun. It would also be cool to bring some of the dehydrated stuff to the farmer's market mm-hmm. in the Highland Center and just share it with people who come there. Mm-hmm. And then we have, oh yeah, we can definitely do mushrooms. That's my mom is asking about mushrooms. <laughs> she knows I love them. Um, yeah, no, we can definitely do all kinds of stuff like that. Um, and then we had another great question about wheels. We do actually have an axle. Um, one of the ends got a little um, kind of mushroomed out from us hammering it in. So um, we want to um, maybe see if we can cut that end off and try to get the wheels on. Um, so we do actually have it drilled for an axle. We just don't have the wheels on yet. Yeah. Uh, and we have time for one more question. Uh, and let's see. So does it need to be in full sun? Um, it is preferable that there's full sun on the actual collector box, um, but you could certainly tuck the major, you know, the, um, the, the collector box under kind of an overhang, especially if it's um, kind of, you know, we get weird weather up on the mountain. So if it's raining on one end of the field and sunny on the other end, you know, something like that. But we could certainly do something like that too. Yeah. Well, thanks for watching. And I think we're going to transition to the next presentation. Yeah. Thank you all so much for watching. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, We are going to move on. Can you, can I? Right. It looked like we, we may have lost Kim here. So I will be happy to introduce our next fellow. Our next fellow is Madeline. Uh, Madeline has been an amazing asset to the farm, so much so that we have asked her to stay up here again next year and to help um, lead the new fellows in the village and in the garden. Oh, Jessica can hear Kim. I cannot hear Kim. Is anyone else hearing Kim? It's just us. We can't hear her. Interesting. I think I'll just keep going. Um, But Madeline, do you want to come on over? Um, Madeline is from Denver and has shared some of her uh, family's knowledge here with us, <laughs> um, but I will hand it over to her. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Madeline, and um, for my capstone, I created a guide um, on the ergonomics of farming for um, the AMI fellows. And I just want to start with a disclaimer. Um, I'm not a medical professional myself. Um, so all the information in this guide um, came from research I did online, as well as guidance from my mother, who is a physical therapist. So thanks, mom, if you're out there. I appreciate it. Um, so in the first kind of few weeks of this fellowship, um, one of the things I noticed was that as fun and amazing as farming can be, doing it every day really takes a toll on your body. Um, and this was something that I talked about with other fellows. And, you know, I would start the day with tense muscles and get to the end of the day and just be sore and exhausted. Um And although some of the fellows up here have more athletic background that they came into this program with, for the most part, all of the physical work we're doing is pretty new. Um, And so there can be a steep learning curve with that. Um, And since our bodies are so important to this program and to being able to do this work, um, I wanted to create a resource that fellows could use um, to refer back to so that they could start each day being physically capable and prepared as possible. Um, And in addition to the need to have more kind of ergonomically minded um, resources, um, when I started looking online for something that could help, um, something talking about, um, you know, the physical aspects of farming, all of the examples that I saw um, were generally men who were tall and kind of conventionally strong. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I don't look much like that. Um, I don't represent a lot of those things. Um, And a lot of the people here don't either. And so, um, in fact, you know, it's this kind of one norm of what a farmer can be um, is actually more damaging than it may seem because, in fact, 25% of farm workers are women um, and 19% of farm workers are disabled. And so, in creating this guide, I also wanted to emphasize um, creating more representation for um, what it means to be a farmer, 
um, and also specifically for AMI, which is a predominantly women run and led organization, um, I wanted this guide to really reflect um, kind of those values and those mindsets. So um, for the context of this guide, um, ergonomics is the process of assessing people's physical limitations as well as their capabilities in relation to their work environment, the tasks they perform, and the tools they use. So um, in thinking about the physical demands of this program, um, ergonomics and this kind of system of thinking was my lens for, for compiling those resources. Um, and the guide itself is broken down into three sections. Um, the first section goes into the tasks and tools that we use up here on the farm. Um, section two um, provides some stretches and workouts that fellows can use to support themselves throughout the program. And then section three looks at the topic of accessibility and farming and how we can um, expand the narrative to include uh, more people, uh, more types of bodies and, and more abilities. Oops. So here I have three pages out of the first section of my guide, tasks and tools. Um, and I wanted to kind of break down the, the common things that we do and look at the best forms um, to support um, our bodies while we're doing them. So I have here um, weeding and harvesting, um, lifting and carrying various items, and then using a tool we have called the Stirapo. Um, and one thing that I found in looking at a lot of these tasks is that um, I was consistently having neck pain and back pain. And this is kind of a common complaint um, with fellows, you know, starting to do this work. And as I was looking into more about proper form, I was realizing that I really wasn't emphasizing um, keeping my back straight and my spine straight. And this is kind of a common um, issue with doing lots of types of manual labor and exercise, but particularly in farming tasks, um, if you're not focusing on, on your spine and that um, kind of alignment, then you're putting a lot of strain on your neck um, and other parts of your body. So that's something that I include kind of throughout a lot of these tasks. Um, I also wanted to um, create a way to make different tasks variable so that, um, for example, with this weeding and harvesting page, um, you know, there isn't one perfect right way to reach the ground. You know, different heights, different body types have different needs. And so for some, it may be easy to bend at the waist and reach down to the ground. For others, it might be easier to squat and rest an arm on a leg. Um, or to squat all the way to the ground. So I wanted to give lots of options so that fellows can adapt these tasks to what they need. Um, here I have three pages from the stretches section of the guide. Um, the way I structured this is so that um, fellows can find the kind of targeted um, place in their body that's giving them trouble. So these are three, again, really common areas, hands, hamstrings, and lower back. Um, there's often soreness in those areas. And so fellows can go to that page and find easy stretches that are, um, for the most part, don't require any equipment and can be done in any comfortable space. Um, and then for the um, stretches and workouts that do require equipment, um, AMI um, help to provide these tools um, that can be um, used for um, future fellows as well. Um, and so now at AMI up on the mountain, we have a foam roller, um, which is great for kind of around your back and stretching out your shoulders. Um, these massage balls, which are great for target targeting specific um, sore spots. These resistance bands, which are fantastic if you don't have like um, dumbbells or weights, um, you can use the resistance as a strength training um, mechanism. And then this is a great new tool that I found um, from a company called Green Heron Tools, which specifically designs um, equipment for women and women's bodies. So a lot of the times, you know, tools are made for a standard size. And if you're not tall enough, for example, it puts a lot of strain on your back or other parts of your body. So this grip can be attached to any standard shovel and it helps with lifting it. Um, so this is something that future fellows will be able to use um, 
if they need it. Also in this section, I have a lot of resources for um, fitness and workouts. Um, they're all online um, free resources. Most of them are um, YouTube videos or apps. Um, so for fellows who want to focus not just on stretching, but also building strength um, and kind of flexibility, um, there's all these resources as well. Um, and since I included yoga specifically in my guide, it was really important for me to also talk about the ways in which yoga, particularly here um, in the US, has been used kind of exclusively as an exercise method um, and has in many ways been stripped of its rich and nuanced value systems and practices and purposes. So although the yoga resources that I include in my guide may be helpful to people, uh, it's important to remember that they don't necessarily represent yoga in its original cultural form. Um, and when practicing any form of yoga, especially as a white person, um, we must acknowledge that there's over 5,000 years um, of history behind the practice. Um, and also we must support um, South Asian practitioners and practitioners of color um, first and foremost. Okay, and then for my last um, section of my guide, I was looking at accessibility and I wanted to look at um, adaptations that can be made to farm spaces as well as community garden spaces um, to make them more accessible. So I looked at um, using raised beds, which is a way to raise garden spaces um, to be more accessible to people who either have to sit in the garden or are using wheelchairs. And so there's some examples here, this really great garden bed design that allows someone in a wheelchair to actually sit beneath it um, for, for the most accessibility. Um, also looking at entryways and pathways and how um, to maintain them so that they're as safe as possible, as navigable as possible, and also the right width to allow a wheelchair to pass through. Um, and then again, looking at ergonomic tools and having um, lightweight tools with adjustable grips so that anybody in that space can use them. Um, and then I also included information about two organizations um, that are doing some of this work. So Agribility is a national organization um, that supports farmers with disabilities. And then Lynchburg Grows is a Virginia-based organization um, that hires individuals with disabilities to work on their urban farm. Um, so these are two great places to look for more information about um, accessibility. Um, and really the biggest takeaways I had from this project um, were one, how important our bodies are um, and how um, caring for our bodies should really be as much a part of this program as everything else that we do in terms of food, in terms of what we're um, taking in taking into our bodies. Um, I also was amazed by the observations um, of other fellows in this program and how they adapted tasks to fit their bodies. Um, a lot of the inspiration for this guide was drawn from them and from just working beside them and watching them. Um, and also, you know, I wanna emphasize that pain and soreness doesn't have to be an everyday experience of farming. Um, my hope is that future fellows can use this guide throughout their experience here at AMI um, and really possess the resources that they need to move um, and feel better while farming. Thank you. Um, let's see, any questions? Yeah, I would love to see um, this information in a pamphlet form. And I think a lot of this can also be applied to at-home gardening and um, isn't necessarily just for large-scale farming. And so especially um, when thinking about like um, weeding and harvesting, like those are definitely applicable to home settings as well. What kinds of injuries are common on the farm? Luckily, we haven't had that many, if if any, this year, knock on wood. Um, I think twisted ankles is kind of a common thing, mostly because um, we're hiking up and down a hill every day. And so um, if anything, that's not even the farming aspect, but um, anything to kind of strengthen um, ankles obviously is helpful with that. 
Um, and then just strained muscles. I think one of the biggest things is lifting more than you think you can. And then the next day you realize that, uh Oh, I made a mistake. I'm in so much pain. So I think another big, um, tip is to just know your limits and always test out something before you commit to lifting it all the way. Any other questions before I pass the baton? Thank you so much, Madeline. Thanks. Thanks, you guys. That was wonderful. Um, next up, we have uh, Olivia Olson coming to us from Plymouth, Minnesota. Um, Olivia, next year, um, we'll be working in Waynesboro um, at uh, the Kate Collins Middle School as the school gardening coordinator. Um, and today, she's going to share with us um, her capstone presentation titled uh, making tofu and integrating it into AMI um, staples for fellows. Hi, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Sweet. Okay. Um, so as Kim said, I'm Olivia, and my capstone was focusing on the feasibility of figuring out how to make tofu for all of us here up on the mountain. Sorry, one second. There we go. All right, so I want to start out and just give a brief overview of the history of tofu in general as we get going. So tofu, it's estimated, was created about 2,000 years ago in China. The exact date is a little bit uncertain, but it's also understood that the Mongolians had a role in the creation of tofu since they ate a fair amount of milk, a lot more than the Chinese people did. And so they had a better understanding of how to coagulate that into making cheese. Um, which was a vital part of that sort of process, turning tofu from soy milk into tofu. And so it spread throughout Asia, became more popular and became a really central part of different culinary cuisines and cultures and histories throughout mainly Asia. And then it spread continually across the world. And so it reached the United States around the 19th century or so with the first tofu maker tofu makers, excuse me, arriving from China and Japan and setting up shops around the country. But it really became more prevalent and sort of launched into the more of the like white U.S. American mainstream food awareness in the 1970s when there was the hippie food movement and the back to the land movement that really propelled tofu forward. And so it was, it has been since then, from that time until today, still kind of heralded as this saving grace of vegetarianism and environmentalism and as this really powerful food to be able to kind of save the world and to feed the people and to have a lower environmental imprint. Although it has been stripped, unfortunately, of a lot of its cultural and culinary histories. And so understanding this and honoring this was really important for me in this project. So, uh, this project came from several different needs and interests, one of which is the fact that here on the mountain, we already eat mostly vegetarian food. And so for many folks around the world, tofu is a pretty staple part of their vegetarian diets. Um, and so I wondered, since we make many of our staple foods here already, including different breads and yogurt and granola and make the vast majority of the foods we eat, what would it take to be able to make tofu for ourselves as well? It would also be able to give us greater autonomy for diets to be able to have the flexibility of choosing when we want to eat this tofu, when we can make it when we want it, instead of purchasing it, having it sit in the fridge in the for a while if we don't need it for a little bit. Um, as well as being able to decide on what sort of style of tofu you'd like to have if you want a softer variety for a certain dish or if you want it to more firm to be able to fry it up um, or do different things like that. This also came out of my own curiosity as I enjoy eating tofu too. And so I've wondered, you know, what's, is it possible for me to be able to make this off the mountain in my own life? So it seemed like a good place to really try this out and see what would happen. It's also just a great source of protein and other nutrients like zinc and iron and magnesium, fiber, calcium, and a, a great way to fuel our bodies. We do a lot of labor intensive work as Madeline was talking about. The goal as I've shared is just to determine the feasibility and ease of making tofu from scratch. What would that take? And then 
hopefully having a bit of a better understanding of could it be passed down to future cohorts? Ultimately, I'm not the final one making that call. I can't read their minds, but at least I would hopefully be able to give them all the tools and know how to be able to do that for themselves. So for this project, what I did is I built a couple of tofu molds. There's a picture you can see on the screen, and then I also have one with me. It consists of three parts. We have the top of it and then the bottom, which and the sides, and so you can set it the sides on the bottom and then this the top piece fits perfectly into the sides so that you can press it down when you have your tofu in the mold. I also created a guide with recipes and instructions for the whole process of making tofu itself as well as different things that you can do with it. So you can see three pages of this booklet on the screen in front of you. Um, and most importantly, I made tofu. It took a little bit of trial and error, but it was exciting to be able to learn how to do that. And I will share more about that process with this slide. So the tofu itself is a few pictures of process of making it. Basically, you start with soybeans, raw soybeans, and you soak them about 10 to 12 hours. Puree then in either, <coughs> excuse me, you can puree your soybeans in a food processor or a blender with some water and cook that with more water on the stove, strain out your solids, um, and you have soy milk. You take your soy milk then and add a coagulant to it, kind of similar to making some sorts of cheese, if anyone has done that before, but you add a coagulant and then let that run to curds. Bottom left photo on the screen is the pot full of whey and curds as the, the soy milk is sitting there on the stove. And then the middle photo is the curds in the tofu mold lined with cheesecloth itself. And then finally being pressed with all of the liquid leaving the tofu block. And the verdict is that it's delicious, um, but there's still some more experimentation and learning that's in order. Uh, I've tried a couple of different ways of making it in terms of different using different coagulants and then different methods of soaking the soybeans. And the first coagulant I tried was using lemon juice, which is not the most common way to make this, but there are some recipes out there where folks have used this. And I figured, you know, well, we have lemon juice on hand, let's try this. And it wasn't reliable enough to be able to say with confidence, yes, this is a recipe that I want to pass down that fellows in the future are going to be able to make consistently and that I could even make consistently myself. And so I tried instead using nigari, which is a mineral byproduct. You can either get it in liquid or crystal form from the extraction of salt from seawater. And it has traditionally been used to make tofu for hundreds of years, which gave me a lot better result. And then I learned also that trying to cut the process a little bit shorter and quick soak your soybeans was not the way to go because for whatever reason, it did not let your soy milk coagulate how it was supposed to. So I had some pretty sorry blocks of tofu for a little bit until I figured out that you just have to, shockingly enough, follow the recipe to a T and soak your soybeans, use nigari or gypsum, and it should work out. So lessons learned overall, a lot of determination, perseverance, as with a lot of different projects that you try out in life, you got to just stick through it when it's not working out, which makes the end product and finally getting the tofu right a lot more satisfying. I learned also that, you know, soy milk is always an option if, if the fellows don't want to do the whole process of turning the soy milk into the tofu. You can always still make soy milk. That's quite straightforward and simple, doesn't require any curdling of anything, um, and have that to drink along with cow's milk here. I learned a lot about uses for okara, which is also called soy leaves. It's, you can see this in the photo on the screen as well. It's the basically the ground up and cooked soybeans that are left over after you strain out all the soy milk from them. And so oftentimes, you could either compost them or throw them out or feed them if you have animals on your property, different things like pigs or chickens, um, different animals really enjoy eating it. But there's also a lot of ways that you can use this food to make human dishes out of. It's They contain a lot of nutrients, a lot of fiber still, so they're a valuable part. And there's lots of different ways to use them that I learned about to help reduce the trash cycle and the amount of trash that we would produce here on the mountain in general or compost. But 
and also just to soak the heck out of those beans. It's not going to work. You got to just plan ahead. And if you be sure that you understand your cooking schedule so that you know when you want to make your tofu and can plan ahead appropriately for it and not be stumped and not have poorly coagulated soy milk. Overall for the project, I now have a much better understanding of what it actually takes to make tofu, um, what works, what doesn't, to be able to have now also all the materials and know-how and be able to pass that on to future cohorts if they so choose to continue do they, doing that and to be able to make that for themselves. I would like to test this a little bit more to see if I can replicate it and to see if a fellow who hasn't made this five times already can follow the recipe and get it done, like be able to create this final product as well. But it's been an exciting and really valuable experience so far. And it's I'm very happy to ha now have this knowledge and skill set. These are all my resources that I used. And then are there any questions? Thank you all very much for coming and listening. Um, I, I see a question to uh, things about things that I've made with the Okara. I have not used it yet, but it's sitting in the fridge. I have found some recipes. I'm thinking I want to try making a zucchini bread out of that. We still have some plenty of zucchini left from the farm that needs to be consumed. And I think that would be a delicious way to try that out. Also, um, I'd like to make crackers out of them as we're constantly snacking. And I think that would be a great way to also try that out. Lots of different recipes for that. Um, what firmness did I manage with the recipe as it stands now? It's kind of, it's like a, a medium to a medium firm kind of firmness. You can still crumble it pretty well, but you can also cut it into strips or pieces and cook it that way. It's not maybe going to be the best at the moment for if you want to just pan fry it. It might fall apart if you try to do that, but it's still able to be used in a lot of different ways. Um, yes, absolutely. I will type the name of the coagulant in the chat. Um, I think, let's see, here we go. It's called Nigari. Um, and you can also use gypsum is also a very workable option. I hear that works really good as well. There's one question up further, Olivia, that I think you accidentally, um, skipped over can soybeans be grown on the mountain oh i see that now thanks for pointing that out to me um yes they absolutely can you can there's enough of a long enough growing season here and a good enough climate to be able to grow soybeans they would take a fair amount of space i did the calculations earlier and i believe it would take about 20 of our 10 to 20 of our current farm beds, which are two and a half by, if you say two and a half by 50 feet beds, you'd need 10 to 20 of those to produce enough soybeans to feed it, all the fellows for the cohort, depending on whether you made one to two blocks of tofu a week. So it's a significant amount of space. It can be done. I guess it's just a matter of whether our farm manager would want to take that on and dedicate all of that square feet to be soybean production, but it is, it is manageable. It's just all of a matter of priorities, I think. And yeah, there's definitely in regards to Jack, your question, there's, I have heard a lot of people going back and forth about some of the issues with soy. And I don't remember all of the technical pieces regarding to the, uh, in regards to the different hormones that, People are concerned with soy. Um, there's issues that folks have said with estrogen. And I've part of what I've read is that it kind of depends on the quality of the soy that you're eating. So if you're eating a lot of very heavily processed soy-based products and in large enough quantities of them, then that can be more problematic, but not necessarily terrible for you. And if you have a higher quality soybean suffused more of an organic or less less processed type of way of eating soy than tend, that tends to be just fine for folks. And as with anything, if you eat anything, if you eat soy in excessive amounts, then no, that's not great for you. 
Um, but that tends to go with any sort of thing. So this is something that I still want to dig a little bit deeper into things have been kind of conflicting with um, folks research and understanding on the internet, but that's a good question though. Thank you so much, Olivia. That was fabulous. You're welcome. Thank you guys. Uh, next up, we have Katerina uh, Masasun, who is coming to us from uh, Los Angeles, California. And next year, Katerina is going to be the education coordinator and farm assistant at Augusta Health. Welcome, Kat. She's going to be talking about nutrition and farming. Hi, everyone. Um, so, like, thank you, Kim, for the introduction. My name is Katerina, and I'm going to be talking all about nutrition and farming. So, before coming to AMI, kind of my background, just to kind of give you all a little bit of an insight into that, um, I was a culinary instructor for almost five years. Um, and during that time, uh, I fell really deeply in love with nutrition. Um, so I decided to actually uh, become a certified nutrition coach. Um, and actually during my time at AMI, I got my second certification into it. So when the capstone was first presented to me, when I came to AMI, I was super excited at the opportunity to potentially kind of create a nutrition type programming. I didn't know what it was going to look like, um, but that's what this presentation is going to talk to you all about. Um, so the first thing I really wanted to do was to actually create a really easy to read and accessible um, guide of all of our produce and all of our pantry items that includes all of the macro and micronutrients. Um, I find that the more information that we have in terms of our dietary needs and our nutritional information, uh, the better decisions that we can make in order to really optimize and make sure that our bodies have the fuel that it needs, especially on a long, hard day of farming. Um, and so with that, I really wanted to make sure that it was really inclusive in regards to the different types of bodies that we have here on at AMI and also just in farming in general. Um, so I chose three different members of my cohort um, to actually create a meal plan for. And I'm going to go over that a little bit later on the presentation. Um, and the last aspect is that I really wanted to address uh, very critically was a lot of the racist components that exist in nutrition as well as medicine, um, especially how deeply it impacts uh, Black and Indigenous and people of color. Um, myself as a Latinx person um, with aspirations to become a registered dietitian, this really means a lot to me in terms of really understanding these narratives and making sure that they are no longer harmful. Um, and when we're actually doing education and a lot of information into the world of nutrition, that we can actually stop these narratives further. So kind of to break it down, what's the basics of nutrition? Um, so our bodies are really dynamic and they're unique um, and they need a lot of fuel in order for it to actually be able to do everyday things. Um, so me just talking, raising my hand, um, the food is essentially what are the things that allow my body to kind of do the basic things that it needs to do in order to function. Um, and so our food are composed of two different things. Um, they're composed of macronutrients and micronutrients. Um, so macronutrients are composed of carbohydrates, fat, and protein. Those are kind of the big main macronutrients. Um, and they vary in terms of what they actually do for our body and also in their complexity and how it's broken down. Um, and when I actually did the meal plan for the three different members of my cohort, I really wanted to make sure that certain things were really addressed, especially the amount of protein that we were getting uh, to make sure that it really met with the physical demand of us being here on the farm and also hiking every single day. And then micronutrients are also super important when it comes to understanding nutrition. Um, they are essentially the vitamins and minerals that exist within our food. Um, and they really help us out with our digestion, making sure that your hair is nice and long and beautiful, um, and uh, really making sure to also do things like strengthen our immunity as well. So they do a lot of the really small nuanced things. So in regards to gender inclusion in nutrition and farming, I think Madeline did a really excellent job in kind of talking about how farming is very, very in terms of how it has historically been viewed and how we currently still view it, it's very much a male body dominated type of field. Um, and But that's kind of the opposite here at AMI. And that was one of the, the things that really, really attracted me to coming to this fellowship was the fact that a lot of the folks that are in AMI are, are femme bodies. And it's wonderful to kind of see how, how that is really a, a staple in terms of how AMI runs. Um, and because of that, the necessity for us as, as femmes to get uh, protein in particular is really, really strong. And I'll kind of explain that a little bit later on in the presentation. 
But one thing I really wanted to stress as well in regards to gender inclusion within nutrition as well, is that when I was researching and how to kind of create these meal plans, I noticed a couple of things that were missing in terms of really creating a fully realized uh, meal plan that kind of includes all parts of us as people. Um, so one is it only biology is different from biological sex is different from gender. Um, so within the actual uh, metrics that formulate kind of how many calories you should be eating in a day, um, it only actually has two different sex, male and female. Uh, there's no intersex or any other kind of metrics for you to include to make it so that it's a little bit different. And there's also no inclusion of gender identity as well, which definitely makes it a little bit tricky in regards to how we can best describe to have a really good, uh, you know, meal plan that's really going to meet your needs as a person. And then on top of that, I found that a lot of the narratives in regards to finding stuff for those who identify as female, specifically when it comes to building muscle and retaining muscle, which is super, super necessary here when it comes to farming and the rigorous activities we do here at AMI, um, all of the kind of basic information and research I did, it made the assumption that if I was going to be looking for something in nutrition and I was looking for the either cisgendered women or females or femmes, it was all about weight loss. Um, and then when it came to males, that it was all about building muscle. And so that type of binary definitely needs to shift in regards to how we talk about nutrition as well. And then a lot of those harmful narratives that kind of happen when it comes to talking about gender also seeps into a lot of conversations when we talk about uh, BIPOC folks. Um, so one of the things that really struck me was this one recent article of a number of registered dietitians were interviewed in regards to how uh, registered dietitians of color specifically and how they are critiquing their field and how they feel that it can be better and more inclusive. Um, so one of the things that Jessica Wilson, who you can see the quote here on the presentation, um, she went to UC Davis. And so UC Davis is in California. And when she was actually doing her master's program, they only had in the curriculum one class, not even an entire, it was one actual course within the class about ethnic diets. Um, and the ethnic diets was less kind of talking about the complexities and the cultural significance about these foods. It was more discussing about how these foods are unhealthy, how they're greasy and how they need to change, um, as opposed to really kind of educating us as, as people in regards to like why certain foods have these narratives and how we can actually shift and change that. And these are a couple of organizations that are really doing a lot of wonderful work in terms of not only doing access uh, for, for folks of color in regards to farming, but also in regards to nutrition access as well. One that was super cool that I found out was uh, Wanda, which is actually based here, based in DC. So not too far away from, from where we currently are up in the mountain. Um, and it is a black specific uh, organization that targets women um, in the, within the black diaspora to really have them go into nutrition, go into dietetics and also go into agriculture as well. So that way they can actually produce food that is culturally relevant to them. All right. So the importance of protein for femme farmers. Um, so Madeline really did a great job of talking about how we hike oh, almost about a mile every single day going up in mountain, as well as doing uh, farm work every almost every single day. Um, and protein is really necessary in order for us to not only build and retain muscle, but just for us to also recover as well. Um, I don't think protein is discussed enough in terms of the recovery that is needed to kind of make sure that after a long work day, we're not feeling as sore the next day so that way our bodies have a chance to really be able to kind of get all the good things that it needs. Um, and specifically for femme farmers, there is a huge risk of lower bone density, stress fractures, and irregular menstruation. Um, actually starting, there's a couple of different, between the ages of 25 to 30, um, typically those who identify as, as, as women um, tend to lose bone density. Um, and basically you're at that point, you're just trying to maintain it. And so being able to actually build muscle within your body to, to help kind of protect that bone, the bone density is a really great way to, in order to do that. Um, in regards to stress fractures, um, there's a lot of divots and things. I'm surprised that not more folks have had injury kind of going up and down the mountain. Um, and so for us to make sure that we actually have the proper nutrients to kind of mitigate that is super important. And then because we are so physically active, it is really important to kind of focus on that protein aspect. Um, as I said in the American uh, Journal of International Society of Sports Nutrition, while it's possible for physical active individuals to obtain their daily protein requirements 
through the consumption of whole foods like we do here on the farm. The supplementation is a practical way of ensuring intake of adequate protein. And so here's what I created in terms of the big part of my capstone. It's actually a nutrition guide. And if you want to actually get, grab your phone, the QR code is active. Um, so the brochure, what I'm hoping for next year is, is either going to be in the kitchen or someplace really easily accessible for folks to look at. It's a quick glance, um, the actual brochure that'll kind of include just an overview of the capstone, um, as well as kind of recommendations in regards to different macros that are in a lot of our staples here at AMI. Um, and then when you actually use the QR code, you're going to see the larger spreadsheet that has all of the macro and micro in nutrition information of our produce, of all of our pantry item staples, and also a slide that includes a way for you to actually calculate your caloric, like your, your calories per day, as well as your macros on a really active day on the farm. And probably, hopefully at the end of the uh, presentation, we could do like a little Q&A. And if anybody wants to write down their name, their age, uh, their preferred gender identity, their height and weight, I can actually... Uh, use the, the, the spreadsheet in order to show you how it works. So here are my recommendations. I want to start off by saying that AMI does a really wonderful job of kind of providing us a really great basic in terms of access to, to protein, but I think there are rooms for, for, for more, um, particularly in three different ways. So the first way is either through an inclusion of like a plant a plant-based protein powder. So that way it could be inclusive of vegans as well as vegetarians. And roughly just in one serving of a protein powder is about 18 to, 20, uh, 18 to 25 grams of protein, which is a good amount in, in terms of what we need to be super active on the farm. Um, and then the second one is actually Vital Wheat Gluten. It's a really, really wonderful product that within just one cup of Vital Wheat Gluten, it contains about 150 to 170 grams of protein. And because we cook for not just for ourselves, but for 10 other people, this is really nice to kind of have a really uh, valuable kind of thing to increase our protein intake in such a small amount. And then third would just to be for actually future fellows to encourage snacking on the farm of uh, snacking specifically in regards like to nuts and seeds, things are high in fat and high in protein. So these are the three lovely people um, that decided that they wanted to help me out with my capstone. Uh, to the left, you're going to actually meet Alex Town coming up next. Uh, y'all, y'all already met Layla in India. So the reason why I chose these three folks specifically is because they really show a range of diversity in terms of what their dietary needs are. Um, so Alex um, is a strict vegetarian. She has been for a very long time. So I really wanted to make sure that not only are her needs met, but also on a dietary level that she can actually yield the necessary things in terms of getting her protein intake on a very strict vegetarian diet. And then for Layla, um, her and I are the are the older folks uh, in the actual cohort. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we had somebody that was not in their 20s, but actually going to be in their 30s, um, as well as she is somebody who's very physically active. She likes to work out before the workday. Um, and also work. And also we do the physical work on the farm. So I really wanted to make sure that I could create a meal plan for her. So that way she doesn't get any risk of injury in terms of overtraining. And then India, it has a much smaller frame and she also has a medical history of migraines. So I kind of wanted to make sure that I could create a meal plan of ideas and suggestions for her to kind of help with her, potentially help with her migraines, but also to help her really build muscle on her small frame in order to really do a lot of uh, active work on the farm. And this is the uh, Layla I'm going to use as more of an in-depth example. So Layla is 5'6". She weighs 135 pounds. She is 29 years of age. And like I said, she is also a farmer, but also an endurance athlete. She was actually planning on running a marathon uh, while coming here. It got canceled because of COVID, but she was actively running miles a day before actually working on the farm. So I really, really wanted to make sure that when I was creating her meal plan and ideas for her, that her particular food um, was very nutrient dense, that it had a lot of good amount of carbs, fat, and protein. So that way, before she actually goes out on the farm, like usually for breakfast, if she eats it, that she's really, really sustainable and has a good amount of energy throughout the entire day and that her body has a chance to recover. And then this is an example of a recipe that I created for her. Um, so I did this for each person, for Alex, for India, and then this one is for Layla. Um, so I recommended a sweet potato hash uh, with cheese, eggs, veggies, and chimichurri sauce. Um, it has a high amount in terms of carbs, protein, and also fat that, like I said previously, will help her kind of sustain throughout the entire day. And QR code if you want to check it out.
And it also has the amount of macronutrients that are also included in the recipe as well. So kind of the key takeaways that I found while doing this capstone. Um, number one, it is really difficult to kind of make a really inclusive metric to estimate calories and macros. Um, like I said previously, the main ones that have been used traditionally throughout the world of nutrition, um, it basically only includes your weight and your height for the most part. It doesn't include any of a lot of the other ones. The one that I chose specifically, I wanted to make sure that I added a couple of different more metrics like your age, as well as your uh, your preferred gender identity to have it be as, as inclusive as possible. And I think that that needs to be done throughout the world of nutrition. And then on top of that as well, even though nutrition um, is specifically actually a pretty female dominated field, registered nutrition is actually 92% of it or identify as female, but there is no gender inclusion when it comes to that. Um, and then on top of that, within that actual percentage, um, BIPOC folks are very, very underrepresented when it comes to actually folks with the, nut the nutrition field. Um, it's roughly about 5% Latinx. It is about roughly five to 7% in terms of black folks and five to 3% Asian and 2% of other. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done to not only include more voices within the world of nutrition, but also to make sure that the harmful narratives that kind of surround a lot of BIPOC food are eliminated, especially in regards to education and on the institutional level, how we actually teach nutrition to folks. Here are a list of my references. Um, that I kind of got throughout my presence throughout the capstone. I really appreciate everybody here. Um, and then as a thank you, I really genuinely really want to thank Layla, India, and Alex. They were very honest with me in terms of really wanting to get more of an understanding of nutrition. And I really appreciate them sharing all their information for me and really and really participating in my particular capstone. So yeah, thank you all. Thank you, Kat, that was wonderful. We do have um, a question in the chat for you. We'll have time for one or two before we hear from Alex. No problem. So did you consider food combining to raise available protein? Um, non, did you consider food combining to raise available protein? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, so the, the thing when it comes to kind of like the produce on the farm, the, 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 the vegetables that we do every single day, I think that we do a really good job of addressing a lot of, um, the carbohydrates as well as fat in regards to what we serve. I think that obviously things like our eggs and, you know, our chickens that we do have on the farm, the reason why I wanted to add additional kind of stuff of, of protein is because I think that there's just rooms to kind of also incorporate vegan diets as well, um, to make sure that we have more things that are specifically plant-based and that are not animal based in terms of our protein. There's also some questions above that about recommendations for those who need to stay gluten free. Recommendations stay gluten free. Um, so interesting, I think gluten free, a lot of the stuff that kind of associated with it, my question to that, are you, are you somebody who is a celiac? Many people are celiac or are extremely gluten sensitive and yeah. not be celiac, Absolutely. but to have the vital gluten protein um, as part of boosting protein in a, a vegetarian or vegan diet may not be the best solution. Right. And I think that that's, that's definitely a great point. One of the nice things about before we come into AMI, we do have to kind of give a lot of our dietary restrictions and us as a cohort members do have to go within the parameters of cooking for those things. So I think if somebody were to say that they were gluten sensitive, that's definitely an option that I would not recommend to be utilized, which is why I wanted to stress multiple different additional protein op options for our recommendations, which is why I wanted to do a plant-based protein powder, um, as well as just encouraging of more nuts and seeds and things like that in terms of eating it on specifically on the day of the farm and then how much okay. yeah I, I understand that it's just the fact that if you have vital gluten protein available someone's going to grab it and it, it could uh, mess someone else up but I, I understand the other forms pea protein and so on so all right, right. thank you no problem we have one one last quick question it's not so quick but one last question <laughs> 
So how much research did you do in regards to indigenous people's diets? Um, so for myself, uh, when I was like actually looking into the different nutritional, like just different diets and things like that is something that I've done on my own in regards to just looking on my own academic perspective. The things that I wanted to kind of stress in regards to those harmful narratives come from a lot of personal experience. So before coming to AMI, I actually developed um, a holistic wellness program um, for, 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 for eight different families who are of Black and Latinx descent. And one of the things that genuinely broke my heart when I was kind of asking them questions in regards to just a lot of notions in regards to what is considered healthy food. Foods, um, they were actually talking about their own foods as unhealthy. Um, like they're talking about the fact that what they've eaten every single day of their entire life, and what really makes them up in regards to what, you know, what fuels their, their, their happiness and how they express themselves via food. They deemed it as not nutritious because that's what they've been hearing over and over and over again. And I think that that is something that just genuinely needs to be talked about in the world of nutrition, how we can, as, as somebody who wants to be in that field, wants to do a better job in making sure that we don't perpetuate those harmful narratives. Thank you so much. Thank you all. We have one last presentation, last but not least, um, Alex Tone from Annandale, Virginia. Um, Alex will be working um, at Berkeley Glen at the Waynesboro Educational Farm next year as our Educational Farm Coordinator. And Alex will be presenting a capstone titled Welcome to the Neighborhood, an online field gu guide for eco-literacy at AMI. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much, Kim. And thank you everybody so much for sitting out through this time. I hope you really enjoyed the presentations and gotten to enjoy all of the really great work people have been doing up here. Let me just, there we go. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you so much, Kim. My name's Alex, and I'd like to tell you about some of the work that I've been doing over the last six months. So just to give you a rough idea about what's going to happen in this presentation, I'm going to talk to you about why I chose this topic, what I set out to do, what I'm hoping this capstone is going to achieve, and then also how we can expand that into the Highland County as a whole. So when we first arrived at AMI, my cohort had a variety of different kinds of knowledge about how to identify plants, how to forage for mushrooms, identifying rocks and things like that, but and a host of other ways to understand what was going on in the environments around us. And while we got an introduction at the start to some of the important aspects of this area, you can see Jessa in this picture here telling us about the indigenous history of Highland County, our local education happened in fits and starts throughout the year in terms of workshops that we had and also chatting with members of the community. And we learned a great deal from each other and from our own research, but we are only scratching the surface of all that there is to know about this area. And in trying to figure out how to address this need, I came across the concept of eco-literacy. Looking at the title of my project, you might be wondering, what exactly is eco-literacy to begin with? The word was coined in 1997 by American educator David W. Orr and Austrian physicist Fritjof Capra. In a nutshell, eco-literacy is the ability to relate human and natural systems to and within each other. And this kind of, this kind of skill is crucial to building relationships with ecosystems, but also to find solutions to environmental problems. Now, of course, this concept was far from new when Orr and Kapra coined the term. Communities across space and time have been practicing and are practicing uh, eco-literacy, both as a means of survival and as culture. And a project like this one needs to recognize the roles of eco-literacy in past and present life ways and emphasize that this kind of work is simply building upon what others have done and valued for a long time. And so this capstone has tried to honor that through extensive research on the indigenous history of uh, Highland in particular and Appalachia more generally, and trying to credit uh, indigenous nations for uh, their particular herbage uses on plant entries in the field guide, which we'll get to later, um, but also talking to members of the Highland community and being able to share their knowledge. Um, so I actually envisioned this project to be a simple field guide of all the plants around the eye, but I soon figured out that was gonna be too much work for not really worth it because uh, this kind of effort had already been done by fellows before me, such as Julia Lohman's Medicinal Foraging Guide and also Georgia Meyer's uh, Indigenous History of the Area. Rather with just a suggestion, I started to think if we have so many different sources of information on these things, what can I do to make it easier for people to access it and use it? How can I create a resource for people to use as a starting point for building relationships with the ecosystems around them? To address this, I put together a website that could go beyond just plant animal species and allow people to also learn about the social histories of Highland and be able to relate this ecological knowledge within human systems. 
And I chose the website as a medium to make this knowledge uh, simple and accessible, but also to allow future fellows to add, edit, or clarify the information on the site and allow it to evolve beyond my time at AMI. Uh, now, I was hoping to be able to give you the, uh, the link to it beforehand, so I'm going to try to put it in the link, the chat this way. Uh, or what I could do is I could give it to you at the end, and so that way we'll be able to continue with the presentation. You can take a look at it for yourself. Um, and what I present to you today isn't necessarily your ordinary field guide. The AMI field guide helps to introduce both newcomers and old timers to the area in Highland, from the small scale understandings of plants and their herbalist uses, to large scale narratives about geologic history, social histories, and more here in Highland and Appalachia. Now this site has been designed to provide uh, easy to access information on plants, herbalism, history, and geology, but also to provide tools for self-directed education such as vocabulary for different kinds of identification and lists of online and local resources for people to explore on their own. In doing so, the project hopes to serve as a starting point uh, for building a literacy among fellows and to help them become more aware, attentive, and appreciative of this incredible area. However, the best part of this project hasn't happened yet. After the Highland Recorder published the titles and descriptions of our capstones, it was fantastic how multiple people from the Highland community reached out to me and they were asking if the field guide would be available for the wider community to use. And while I didn't originally anticipate the field guide's audience to go beyond AMI, I'm eager and interested to expand this project to promote eco-literacy at AMI to the whole county. And so here are, so this is a flyer that I'd like to um, show for the next fellows will be able to access, uh, as well as some things that future fellows might be able to add to the um, to the field guide. Uh, so this is a, a general plan for how I'd like to expand the AMI field guide into the Highland field guide. First, I'd like to connect with local historians, herbalists, and foragers to provide input on the aims and content of the website and uh, to be able to create a more unified body of knowledge that people can access. Secondly, I'd like to consult with community members to assess existing levels of eco-literacy, what people are knowledgeable about, and how to better incorporate that into the website but also to assess levels of interest in uh, different aspects that the field guide could cover that people could be able to um, see on the website and be, uh, be very specific to the community in that sense. In terms of the website itself, I'd like to change it so that it could create discussion spaces on the website so that people can engage with this information in a more collaborative way, such as asking and answering questions, corroborating knowledge, being able to describe the plants at different stages of their life, and other ways of producing collective information. Uh, and this fourth point is a bit of a sticky one uh, in terms of the process for it, in terms of who gets to edit this website. Is it going to be one person? Will it be an open forum thing like Wikipedia? Will that be something that is responsible for a member of the Highland community or somebody at AMI? That's something that um, is important because we want to make sure that this information uh, is valid and relevant, but also that it remains accessible and collaborative for people within the county to um, contribute to and be able to collectively own. And then finally, publicize the field guide through print and uh, online means. Now, this is hopefully just the start of a rich and constantly evolving body of knowledge for both AMI and the wider Highland community. In the meantime, I'm grateful to all of the folks in Highland and AMI that have taught me and my cohort how to love this land and learn more about it. And I hope that this project can help to start paying it forward. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have at the moment. In the meantime, I'm gonna to try to get the link to you so that you can explore the website, but thank you for your time. Alex, I tried to put it in the guide while in the chat while you were talking. I'm not sure if it's linking for everybody or not, but you can add it again. I can give it a try. Okay. Lots of people are sharing their accolades with you. Yeah, the link is not working, but you can you can put it in again and see if it works for people. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have questions for Alex as she tries to find us the link? It will also be available on our website in in the, in the coming days. Well, if you have questions as you start to explore it, <laughs> you can reach out to Alex. I'm sure she'll be able to, uh, to answer questions and also be interested in the information that you can uh, contribute as well. I'd also like to emphasize that this has already been a collaborative work in that 
not only have I learned so much from other fellows, members of AMI here and contributing different information, but also members of the Highland community. I'd also like to particularly thank Marsha Alaska for all of her contributions in the herbalist and local history guides, but also uh, Tammy from the Highland Recorder for speaking to me yesterday. You're going to see a piece about this in the Highland Recorder soon. So thank you. Well, thank you to our audience and to all of our fellows who presented a round of applause. <laughs> you can use your reactions to give a round of applause. Uh, we appreciate everyone that has joined us and all the fellows that did the hard work um, to, to get these capstone presentations to where they are and the learning and sharing that took place. Uh, we appreciate your uh, patience with technology early on in this as we sorted it out. Um, all of this information will be on our website and a recording of this will also be shared on our YouTube page, which is accessed um, by our website. Uh, we um, love that you are here with us and there are going to be additional ways for you to connect. Of course, um, we offer workshops on a regular basis that you can find through our website. Um, there are volunteer opportunities. We are always looking for people who are interested in, in supporting AMI, uh, either through monetary donations or being advisors or serving on our board. Uh, and um, in addition, we're always looking for new great fellows. And so Jess is back on the screen and can share a little bit about um, the upcoming, upcoming dates and opening of the fellowship. Yeah, so we will be opening the application for the fellowship in early December and then starting around mid-May for our next group. Um, so uh, word of mouth is our most important way to find fellows. So appreciate your uh, support and sharing the opportunity. Thank you so much and have a great night.